The story starts with a young boy, Magu, hunting for a hog by making a perfect aim from afar, with the help of a friend blessed with detection skills. After the successful hunt, his friends start praising him for his flawless hunting, which makes him feel shy yet happy to be useful, even though he has not received his skill yet. In his world, everyone receives a skill from God after reaching adulthood, and this skill can be of any kind. Some skills dramatically improve swordsmanship or grant medical ability, while others can turn one into a master of cooking. However, there are also off skills, which can bring disadvantages and even be considered a curse for someone. Magu's friends ask him what skill he wants to gain. One of his friends wanted him to join their party to make a lot of money, while the other friend wanted him to join his dad's vigilante corp and help the citizens. But Magu wanted to decide all of this after receiving his skill. He tells his friends that he wishes to gain a skill that can benefit the city. One of his friends replies that he should be a little greedy and think about his own benefits. However, his other friend reminds him that he wants to become just like his parents, who sacrificed themselves while protecting the city from the giant mutant lizard. His parents were part of the esteemed first and second place vigilante corp in the city. They were cool, kind-hearted and loved by everyone in the city. One day, a giant-sized mutant lizard attacked the city and Magu's parents confronted it. Their priority was to protect the city and they accomplished their mission by killing the lizard. However, they had to sacrifice their lives for it. Their only wish for Magu was to live a happy life. Since then, the entire city took care of Magu, ensuring he never felt the absence of his parents. He grew up with their help and support and now wanted to repay their kindness by achieving a good skill. Today was his coming-of-age ceremony, and he was excited and nervous, knowing he would be blessed with a skill. He went to the church with a lot of hope, unaware of the off-skill decoy he was about to receive. Decoy was a skill that attracted monsters day and night considered one of the worst skills. He was in disbelief and wished to have another skill, but skills were predetermined and couldn't be changed, leaving him feeling as though it was a death sentence. He was truly upset and not ready to accept his fate. He looked towards the pastor with hope, but the pastor could only express his sympathy as he couldn't intervene in God's plan. Losing all hope, Magu came out of the church, wondering what he should do next. He wanted to live for the city but all of his plans failed after receiving this skill. On his way back home, he was shocked to find a large crowd standing in front of his house, packing his belongings. Some people were discussing how he received an off skill, while others were putting his belongings on a cart. When he asked why they were doing this, they told him to leave the city for the sake of their lives and to live in a hunting shack in the mountains. Magu was not ready to believe this, but an old man appeared before him, explaining that he is now a threat to the citizens because of his skill decoy. His skill would lure monsters, putting the city in danger. Everyone was angry and wanted him to leave. Some shouted that he might cause another lizard man attack, while others expressed that they didn't need him anymore. No one remembered that how his parents lost their lives saving the city. They were only worried about their own lives. Magu accepted his fate and decided to leave the city, moving towards the mountains with his cart full of luggage. He wondered what he did wrong to deserve such a fate. He had always wished well for the city, so why was he being punished like this? Suddenly, a big dark kobold appeared in front of him, and his skills started attracting monsters. The dark kobolds multiplied, and Magu ran as fast as he could toward the mountains, with numerous dark kobolds following him. As he ran, he could only think about his parents and their desire for him to live and protect the city. The kobolds attacked him, and he fought back, but their large numbers overwhelmed him causing him to become weaker and lose focus. The kobolds kept hitting him one by one, and he found himself growing weaker and weaker. Suddenly, a beautiful voice offered Magu some help. While a group of dark kobolds were beating Magu, and he was losing all of his strength, he heard a beautiful voice. The voice offered him some help. Magu turned towards it, and to his surprise, a beautiful girl was standing in front of him. Magu got shocked. He asked that girl what she is doing in such a dangerous place. He wanted to help the girl. Meanwhile, a dark kobold punched Magu so hard that he flew away and fell on the ground far away. Magu tried to get up from the ground. To his surprise, the girl was still standing there. He thought that if he does not help the girl leaving this place, she will be in trouble too. Magu got really shocked when the girl asked him to escape. The girl created a large light ball through her hand and attacked kobolds with it. Kobolds fell far away due to the attack. Magu started wondering how that small girl is so strong. What is she? Is she using some kind of magic? The girl turned towards Magu to tell him that she is fine. Kobolds again tried to attack Magu, on which the girl got really furious. She started thinking herself that she will not allow those kobolds to hurt Magu anymore. She created a big thunder attack, due to which all the kobolds fell far away and died. Magu also fell far away and got hurt. 
The girl got worried and started running towards Magu. Magu was injured badly and not in his senses. The girl put Magu's head on her lap. She was sorry for hurting him. When Magu came to his senses, he asked whose lap is that. He saw the girl and got up. He told her that he can attack those kobolds, but he is covered in scratches. He was sorry that he is injured and not helping her properly. But to his surprise, there were no kobolds attacking him anymore. He started wondering where all the kobolds went. The girl pointed towards them, saying that she got all of them. It was a shocking moment for Magu. He couldn't believe his eyes. How were all of them dead? How did this small girl do this? Is the girl some kind of magician? Or is she a mage? In this world, some people possess strange kinds of powers, and they were called mage. But to become a mage, one must have exclusive skills. Magu was looking at the girl with astonishment. He thought that the girl is very young for these kinds of powers. But her actions made him think, is she really that young or older? Suddenly the girl breaks the silence by shouting that she was not using any kind of magic. On which Magu shouted back that then how she killed so many kobolds alone. The girl asked Magu to move a little, and then she stood up with satisfaction on her face. She was sure that Magu is not a dangerous person, and there is no need for her to hide her real identity from Magu. She told Magu that she is going to share a special secret with him and will show him who she really is. Suddenly she disappeared in a big ray of light. Magu got anxious about what was going on. How did this big ray of light appear? How is her body shape changing? What kind of crazy power is this? The girl's voice appeared, asking what he thinks of her. When the ray of light disappeared, it was a dragon standing in front of him. Magu was stunned. A dragon, he shouted. Then he patted her, because he was amazed that the girl was a dragon. According to Magu, the girl was like a divine beast from a fairy tale. These kinds of beasts used to appear in the stories and legends. They were the monsters that were able to speak human language but had powers like a dragon. The dragon turned into the girl again and asked Magu to call her Loa instead of dragon or divine beast. Magu also introduced himself to her. Magu wanted to get close to her, but he said that he is too old for this. Upon hearing this, Loa asked shockingly why he is calling himself old. Magu replied that it is because of his skill decoy, which can attract monsters. So Magu doesn't want to put Loa in danger by staying close to her. Loa got frustrated and answered why Magu thinks that a dragon can be afraid of these measly monsters. He asked Loa to leave because he didn't want to cause more trouble to her. He was really touched by her help, but Loa refused to leave. She told him that she was so attracted to his voice that she doesn't want to leave him right away. Magu confusingly asked that why she was attracted to his voice. Loa told him that he was determined to live and never die. She could hear his voice due to his skills that's why she flew towards the pond. She said that he will not understand that what she is saying. But Magu apologized because Magu used to think that he can only attract demons. He didn't know about attracting other beasts. Loa told him that the skill he is calling decoy is actually known as the collar among the dragons. According to Loa it is called the collars among others beings also. Loa asked him that if he has the ability to call demons outside of the rest of the world, which made Magu think about his skill. Loa said that this skill can be used to call divine beast and it can make man and beasts prosper together. Magu wondered that how he used to think all of this as a fairy tale once. But Loa was also worried that if she can hear his thought from afar, then other beasts can also hear him. She wondered that what other kinds of beasts have heard his thoughts. Magu started thinking that how kobolds were reacting when he was thinking about saving the city. Magu finally realized that decoy is the product of skill to convey one's thought to a beast, but it was also strange and uncomfortable for him that his thoughts are not private anymore. He started thinking that other people who possessed the decoy skill, were they also saved by some divine beast Loa? If yes, then why is there still talk of people with decoy skills having short lifespans? Loa said that people who possess the collar skill also have dirty minds. The demand a lot of things and dragons don't help these kind of bad peoples. But Magu was different according to Loa, who only wanted to live to his fullest. That's why Loa was interested in him and wanted to know him more. She doesn't want to become a target of a person with straight heart and no lies. Magu told her that he wanted to return the kindness of the citizens. But when he was given the skill decoy, it was kind of a punishment for him. He also wanted to die because of that. Magu asked Loa that is it possible that he can be useful to someone again. Loa answered with excitement that yes he can do it. Then Magu got up and asked Loa that he is thankful for the encouragement but will she be able to lend him her powers. Loa agreed and hugged Magu. She told him that she will take care of him. Magu was very thankful to her. Loa hugged him so tight that Magu fell on the ground. Loa apologized. Now Magu wanted to take some rest and hunting shake was just around the corner. He moved his luggage there and started his new life with Loa. Next morning when Magu was still sleeping, 
someone smacked open the door. It was another beautiful girl. She asked Magu not worry about anything as she will take care of him from now on. Magu was taken aback and bewildered by the girl's sudden appearance. He inquired, who are you? The girl introduced herself as Fia the Phoenix, explaining that she felt the power of her master's words and traveled across the sea to reach him. Magu couldn't believe how she managed to cross the sea in just one night, a journey that usually took months, nor could he fathom how a phoenix appeared before him. He then realized that this was the result of his skill. Fia got frustrated upon his cold reaction because she was expecting him to get more surprised on her arrival. But Magu told him that he experienced the same thing yesterday. Fia was angry at him. Suddenly Loa got up from the other side of Magu's bed rubbing her eyes and wondering that with whom Magu is talking so early in the morning. Magu asked her that why she was not sleeping in other room. When Loa came to her senses she saw a feather on the bed. Then she looked at Fia and realized that she is a phoenix. She shouted with anger a phoenix. Fia also got angry and asked that what a dragon is doing there. Magu tried to calm them down but they told him that Dragon and Phoenix don't get along and they've been fighting for the supremacy in the sky for thousands of years. Both of their anger created a thunder due to which one wall of the house fell down. Magu angrily asked them to stop. After ending their fight, he covered the broken wall with wooden sheets. He scolded them by saying that he was about to lose another house because of them. Both Fia and Loa apologized. When Magu realized that they are calling him master he asked them to call him by his name. But Fia told him that she can't possibly do that because if there is a caller who can read the mind and blood of a beast, which is obligatory for a beast to give him at the time of need, so they can't call their name out of the blue. Fia told him that he has a good heart and she is ready to help him any time. Upon hearing this Loa got jealous. Magu told both of them that he is happy that both of the beasts are around him. He doesn't want to burden them but he knew that he needs their help. He requested them to get along as all three of them are going to live together. Loa was kind-hearted to she agreed without thinking anymore. Fia also doesn't want to back off. Both of them promised to get along. Magu thanked both of them and suggested that now they should move to dining table for breakfast. While eating Magu told them that they have enough food for few days but after that there should be a proper source from which they can obtain food to survive in the forest. He told them that there is an area from where they can obtain wild vegetables and water. It was not very convenient for them, but securing a field and a well is the only solution. So after breakfast they decided to go for the search of drinking water. Magu was really exited, but when he pulled the cart, he realized he was not strong enough because of his injuries. When Fia and Loa saw him struggling, they ran towards him and offered help. But Magu refused by saying that at least he can handle this much. Because if any kind of demon appear they should both defeat him. Fia looked at him with a sad face and told him that she is there for help. But Magu convinced both of them by saying that pulling cart is a kind of good rehab. Both Fia and Loa wondered that why Magu is leaving here alone and not going back to his hometown. Soon they realized that Magu was kicked out of his hometown. They both got really angry and wanted to teach townspeople a good lesson but Magu diverted their attention towards the pond. Loa got excited and ran towards it to play with water. Fia refrained from joining as she didn't want to extinguish her flames but Loa playfully splashed water on her. This led to a brief argument between Fia and Loa, which Magu intervened to stop. Fia noticed that Magu was getting shy because her clothes were a little bit exposing after getting wet. She teased Magu but Loa was getting jealous. Finally, they both helped Magu in filling water pots and collecting vegetables and medicinal herbs, for which Magu was very thankful to them. However, Fia sensed something approaching from the woods and warned her master to be cautious. They all got curious about what is about to appear from the woods. Magu was not mentally ready to welcome other demons as a lot of things happened yesterday, and it was too soon for him. Fia asked Magu to back off and instructed Loa to stay close to him. But as Magu was expecting, a new demon appeared in front of him. It was giant and had big teeth. Magu shockingly shouted that it is a human-eating troll. Magu was upset and realized that the monster appeared because of his decoy skill. He blamed himself for putting Loa and Fia in danger. Fia attacked the troll but couldn't help much because she was covered in water. The troll then attacked her, but Fia turned herself into a phoenix and attacked the troll again. She first made a feather attack. When the troll got busy stopping that, she started throwing fireballs towards him. The troll got burned and died. Magu thanked Fia for saving him, but a large group of trolls appeared again. They encountered them furiously and decided to run towards home as fast as they can. On the way back home, different kinds of demons tried to kill them. But with the help of Loa and Fia, they managed to reach home safely with the food and water they collected. After reaching home, Magu realized that every time they go on the road, it becomes a disaster. 
He decided that before getting their lives in order, they need to do something about all the demons. Loa suggested to Magu that she can get rid of all the demons for him. Magu asked her if it is possible to get rid of them all, completely. To which Loa replied that it is impossible completely, but she can at least try. All she had to do is fly near the mountain. Fia asked her if she is really ready to leave her old territory to fight against demons. Magu realized that once a dragon establishes a territory, they stay there for the rest of their life. Magu never wanted to use them for his game, so he refused this idea of Loa, but she told Magu that one day dragons have to live on their own. She was ready to establish a new territory in this mountain. She ensured Magu that she was doing good since she arrived there. Establishing the territory on the mountain doesn't mean that she can't go anywhere else. Magu was so touched by her words. Loa asked him to treat her like a grown-up. Later, Magu prepared dinner for them. They both enjoyed dinner so much because it was their first time eating a cooked meal. Magu was satisfied that there is enough water in the house for the time being. But now their priority is to grow a field. Both Loa and Fia suggested that they can bring vegetables from the mountain. But Magu was not ready to take any kind of risk. Besides, he always wanted to have a big farm. He had seeds of a few vegetables. Loa asked him if he knows anything about farming. Magu replied that he has helped his friends in farming. But Fia said that they don't have enough water for it. Magu wondered if it is possible for them to build waterways. He teased Fia by saying that canals usually develop on their own, to which Fia gave funny expressions. But Fia said that they have a lot of time to think about all of them, and that they were ready to help him in this mission. They wanted Magu to live his life the way he wants. Loa then took off to chase the demons away, and Magu asked Fia to help him in plowing the field. Fia took out a power sword and handed it over to Magu. She told him that he can protect his life using this sword. Magu was thankful and embarrassed because he was only receiving help from both of them. Fia hugged him and said that they can risk their lives for him. But Loa came back and when she saw Fia hugging Magu, she got angry and attacked her. Fia attacked back and they both started fighting. Magu saw them and thought that somehow he should also be useful to them. The next morning when Magu woke up, he got shocked because there was a well in front of his house. Magu was wondering how a well appeared in front of the house. There was nothing here until yesterday. Is the water drinkable? While he was thinking all of this, a beautiful girl appeared behind the well and asked Magu if he is the caller who summoned her. Magu's skill started to flicker instantly, and he wondered who this girl was. The girl introduced herself as Mara, an insignificant water spirit. Magu wondered if he has already gotten used to it. He also introduced himself and asked Mara if she is also a divine beast, to which she replied yes and told him that she is from the Kelpi tribe. Kelpies are a peculiar type of sacred horses that reign over the underwater, even subduing big waves such as rivers and inland waters. Magu thought again that these kinds of beasts are usually found in fairy tales. He asked Kelpi why she is here, to which she replied that they have an ancient rule, that they must lend a hand to callers who need help to find water. So she was worried because she was informed that her caller needs water. Hearing this made Magu wonder again how this is possible, but then he apologized. Mara told him not to apologize and that she is happy to see him delighted, as she worked really hard for this well. Magu thanked her for doing this. He asked Mara how it was possible for her to prepare a well overnight with drinkable water in it. She replied that it was not a big deal for her as she only had to manipulate the underground water. Suddenly, Fia appeared and asked angrily what a kelpi is doing here. Loa was hiding behind Fia, but she got happy to see Kelpi. It was also interesting for Mera to meet a dragon and a phoenix together. Loa expressed pleasure while greeting Kelpi, but Fia, she was so angry. Both her competitors were here helping Magu. She also shouted at Magu, asking why he is alluring her stupid enemies towards himself. Magu calmed her down and prepared breakfast for all of them. For Mara, it was a good experience because she never had a human meal before. Loa told her that now they are going to grow a garden for Magu where he can cultivate different kinds of vegetables. Loa started sowing the seeds, but Magu was tensed because it was not the right time for sowing. Fia warned her that if she ruined the seeds which their master brings her, she'll be doomed. But Loa performed a kind of magic and it took vegetables and plants a few minutes to grow up completely. All of them were shocked at how Loa did this alone. She told Magu that her grandfather was a terrestrial dragon who controls the power of the earth. They are basically the reincarnation of the earth. So Loa inherited this power from him. Loa then asked everyone to try fruits from the trees. The fruits were so tasty that they couldn't stop eating them, especially Fia. Loa thanked Mara for all this, which surprised Mara. Loa told them that she can only use this power when there is a lot of water available, so it was all possible due to the well that Mara made. 
Mara got happy because she was helpful to them. Loa suggested that she should grow more plants using her power and asked Mago and Fia to plow the remaining field. When Mara was busy watering the plants using her power, she accidentally created a hot water pond. But for Magu, it was a good surprise. Magu asked Mara to expand this pond and surround it with stones. At the end of the day, Loa and Fia were so tired that it took them a second to pass out after dinner. Mara was curious about the pond, so she was working on it. Magu went to see Mara to check if she is fine. Mara asked Magu if she could stay with them for some time. As for Kelpies, it is difficult to control their power and it will take some time to develop canals and water channels. Also, it is a tradition among Kelpies that young ones leave their hometown for training and to gain experience. This mountain had plenty of water for her training. Magu replied that she can stay as long as she wants. He was happy that he got such good friends. But someone was watching both of them from the tree trunk and wondering how Magu is still alive. In the village, some people in the Vigilante Corp office were discussing how they have seen very few demons since Magu left the village. They must have followed him to the mountain. The second man replied that yes, this is the reality. Soon, the girl who was listening to the conversation of Mare and Magu from the tree trunk arrived in the office and told her father that Magu is alive. She was the same girl who wanted Magu to join her father as a Vigilante Corp before he received the skill, decoy. Her father asked shockingly how he is surviving there. The girl replied that he is fine and there are no signs of war there. Also, he is not living alone there. Some divine beasts like dragons also live with him. The second man replied wordly that Magu is now a threat to all of them. What if he pisses off the dragon with a stupid mistake and runs back to the city? This can cause a lot of damage. The old man then stepped into the conversation and suggested that they should now kill Magu as he will keep attracting different kinds of beasts. Upon hearing this, the young girl and another young boy got worried. Here in the forest, Magu was trying to use the sword that Fia gifted him. The sword was creating fire. Magu thought that he is not even any kind of magical creature, but using the sword makes him feel different. He then noticed that Loa was staring at him with jealous expressions. Magu asked her why she is worried. Loa replied that, like Fia, she also wanted to give him something important. Magu assured her that she is already doing a lot for him. She was the first one to save him and has a special place in his heart. Loa told him that she wants her caller to be safe by entrusting him with a portion of her power. Both dragons and phoenixes have the same tradition in this case because Fia also added a part of her power to the sword. She explained that this tradition originated from the legend of the first caller. According to a story that has been handed down to her family, a long time ago, a being called the Demon God appeared and tried to rule the world with fear. Then a man who had a connection with many divine beasts defeated him by unifying the powers of those beasts. But he died in exchange for defeating the demons. Loa took out her sword and handed it over to Magu, saying that she wants him to use her powers solely to protect himself. Magu was touched by Loa's actions and told her that she should allow him to use these powers to protect her as well. Loa and Magu both were happy, observing the care they have for each other. Magu was now motivated to do as much as he can for these divine beasts. He went out to hunt rabbits for dinner. While hunting, he thought that these beasts are the reason he is alive today. He was not even sad for leaving the city. He wanted to repay them, so he decided to take the lead on food, house chores, and lifting heavy things. Soon, a group of fighters appeared in front of him, declaring that they found him. Magu was shocked at how they got so deep into the mountains. They started beating Magu. Then the old man from the vigilante corp office asked them to stop. He told Magu how dangerous he is for the city. He brought the dragon here with his decoy skill. Now it is only safe to kill him to protect the city. The old man ordered the fighter group to kill Magu. When they started attacking him, Magu fought back. He was furious that his hometown people are not letting him live in peace. First, they kicked him out of the village, and now they want to kill him. The old man said that he should not act selfishly by putting the city people in danger. They took care of him and helped him to grow up. Magu thought that now it is not possible for him to escape the situation because the old man is so strong that he can turn multiple kobolds into ash in no time. But Magu fought back with all his might. He asked them to back off, otherwise, he will destroy their city. He also tried to clarify that dragons are not dangerous like other monsters. They can speak and understand human language, and they don't unnecessarily destroy their territory. Soon, an arrow coming from the woods injured Magu. It was his vigilante corp friends. Mag got injured because of the arrow hitting his shoulder. He then saw the feather attack coming towards the fighter. He knew that it was Fiona. He suddenly realized that he had Fia's sword and could borrow her strength. The old man threw a fireball towards him, but Magu succeeded in stopping that attack due to Fia's sword. 
He then realized that with just a sword, he could destroy their magic. The old man then attacked him with greater water bullets. Magu thought that Fia's sword might be a bad choice for this, but then he suddenly pulled out Loa's sword and prevented the attack. The old man was in shock, wondering what was happening. Mag is not even a wizard, nor a mage but less than a sage. How did he acquire such extraordinary powers? Mag replied that this is the power of decoy, which the old man and his followers have cast out. He was given this power by all those who have lent their strength to him. The old man replied that he was right and Magu is now a danger to all of them. They started attacking Magu again. Mag realized that even though he is borrowing everyone's power, it is tough to be hit by that magic over and over again, and he can only use his magic skills with the aid of magical weapons. The old man said that he will not allow Magu to live like this and tried to attack him with heavenly detonation. Magu realized that he saw the same magic once before when a huge swarm of demons attacked a town. The magic wiped out the entire town with just one strike so, Magu thought that he now has to run for his life. Suddenly a phoenix appeared from behind the woods and warned the old man not to attack his masters. The old man could not believe his eyes, wondering how it is possible for a phoenix to talk like a human. Fia then looked towards her master and told him that she rushed there after sensing that Mag was endangered. She then asked Mag about the old man and his men. Mag told her that they are the leaders of his town. The old man then asked Magu how much more trouble he wants to cause. Fia was disappointed in them because they were even worse than what she heard about them and wanted to punish them herself. But someone angrier appeared in front of the old man. It was Loa in her dragon form. Loa warned them not to mess with her territory. But now they have raised their hands against her precious master, so she asked them about their thoughts. The old man and his men were too horrified to speak. Loa angrily asked them to reply. Mag realized that Loa is really pissed off. The old man was sorry and told them that he had no idea that those divine beasts had allowed Mag to get to them. He just wanted to keep Mag away from the town. But Loa wanted to drive him away all the way to the afterlife. Loa asked the old man if he knew why God gave humans the skill decoy. Have they ever thought about it? To which the old man replied that it was a skill that would attract demons. Fia then told them that humans have been around for a long time. Yet they seem to have forgotten the importance of the caller, especially nowadays when there are no invasions of demons or catastrophes in human settlements like there used to be. She told them that the caller is a person who communicates with divine beasts and protects the world of mankind. When humans can't handle things on their own, they can ask for the help of a divine beast. It is an important existence that connects people and divine beasts for the good of this world as well as the world of mankind. Legend has it that the caller is born when a greater disaster occurs. If you are a powerless person, you'd like to have that kind of power right now. Then Loa said that it is pathetic that they didn't know about this. Magu told the old man that these creatures are capable of reason. They are not going to attack the city, and if they do, it will be because of what the old man has done to them. He said that this time it was his fault for making them nervous, but he never wanted to cause more trouble. He was not going to do anything to the city, and he never wanted to go back there again. He just asked them to let him stay here in peace. Besides, these divine beasts here are the only things that will make this town safer. It is the last thing he can do for his hometown. So he asked them to go back to the city and not run amok in the mountains. It was best for both of them to live in peace and safety. The old man told him that he is not in a position to refuse him anymore. He said that due to his contact with the dragon, they misunderstood them and wanted to wipe him out. The old man then apologized and said goodbye to Mag with the hope that they will never meet again. Both Lo and Fia were amazed by the kindness of their master. Fia told him that if she were in his shoes, she would have put a few blasts on them. Mag assured them that the old man will never try. He was sure that the chief was tired of dealing with Lo and Fia more than anything else. Both Lo and Fia were now satisfied. On their way back home, they all wondered where Mera was. Magu got worried because he didn't want Mera to get injured because of him. When they reached home, Mira welcomed them with a few strange men. Mira was satisfied that Mag is fine. Loa told Mag that those men barged into the house and started yelling at her. Mira then decided to deal with them alone and asked Loa and Fia to protect their master. Magu was thankful to all three of them. Loa decided to take those men away from the mountain meanwhile Mag promised to make them a good dinner. After dinner, Loa, Mira, and Fia went to sleep. Mag was thinking that he didn't want to put any of them in danger, and now he wants to live a quiet life. Suddenly, a black cat walked past him. It has been a week since the chief and his men attacked the mountain. Magu and the divine beasts were leading a peaceful life without any problems. With the help of Loa, they were able to grow many crops, and it was Mag's duty to water them. He wanted to do these kinds of chores himself because he had been depending on the divine beasts for almost everything. 
After watering the plants, Mag decided to take a bath in the hot spring. He felt relaxed while bathing and thought about how his skills had led him through many experiences. He never imagined he would be able to live such a luxurious life during the daytime. He was ready to sleep there when Fia and Mira arrived, expressing their wish to take a bath in the hot spring too. Magu got confused and tried to stop them, explaining that hot springs were separate for males and females according to human rules. Mira informed Magu that she wanted to train Fia in dealing with water. Fia explained that she had been watching Mira's training and tried to copy it but almost got drowned before Mira saved her. Magu allowed them to take a bath in the hot spring but without uncovering themselves, and they both agreed to this condition. Fia mentioned that she used to think that taking a bath in a hot spring was the same as boiling in a hot kettle, which made Mira laugh at the concept. While they were talking, the dragon suddenly appeared and told Magu that she was done hunting her prey. Mag praised Loa for doing a good job patrolling the area and thanked her for everything. Loa also jumped into the water to take a hot spring bath, which embarrassed Magu. In the middle of their conversation, they heard a meowing voice. To their surprise, there was a black injured kitten hiding in the grass. Mag picked up the cat and patted it, and Loa found the cat too cute and wanted to play with it. Mag wondered if the cat was a monster, but Loa explained that it was impossible to determine that right now because the cat was too small. Monsters only reveal themselves when they grow up. The kitten started playing with them, and she was too cute to be a monster. Fia wondered how the cat entered Loa's territory since this was Loa's territory. Mag suggested that if the cat was harmless, they should help her. He expressed that even though he was a monster, he was just a child, and it would be a shame to leave him there to die. Magu wanted to prepare something for her to eat, so he asked the three of them to return home. Mag gave soup to the kitten, and she started drinking it. He told Fia that there was no milk, so he was worried if the soup would be okay. Fia replied that monsters are tough, so they usually eat anything they can. Mira helped the kitten a lot in recovering and regaining her strength. However, they were wondering how the little kitten entered Loa's territory, as it was practically suicide for a monster child to enter a dragon's territory so brazenly. Mag expressed his thoughts that maybe another divine beast had appeared, but Fia said that if it were true, they would have noticed it by now. Loa suggested that the kitten might have come from a place she couldn't see, like a cave. So they decided to explore the mountain after lunch. After finishing lunch, they all started exploring the mountain. They all heard Loa's voice and ran towards her. Loa showed them a cave and told them that it is a cobbled nest. She explained that it is very similar to where she was born, a dark, peaceful, and cool place. When strangers go in, they need to be careful and move slowly. According to her, the rocky areas are perfect for building. Mag wondered that this valley has many places to hide making it the perfect natural fortress that doubles as a nest. Loa told them that this cave is strange, and the magical power of the surrounding area seems to be cut off only in that space. They also felt a weird smell coming from the cave. They decided to go inside the cave. Suddenly, a large group of monsters, including trolls and kobolds, appeared in front of them. They all were shocked and assumed that this cave was actually a dungeon. It was a feature of some dungeons where monsters all appear at once. Loa could feel an unpleasant flow of magical power. Mag asked them to deal with this quickly by having a head-on fight with the monsters. Fia expressed her concern that the one who created this dungeon most likely knows about them. Loa also hated the presence of a dungeon in her territory. Mira said that if they leave this cave as it is, this may become massive, absorbing the entirety of this mountain as it expands. And if that were to happen, there wouldn't be anything they could do about it. They defeated all the monsters and went inside the cave. The cave was like a labyrinth from a fairy tale. Mira explained that what they are aiming for is in the innermost section. If they defeat the boss monster there, the dungeon will stop functioning and the adolescent monsters will disappear over time. Loa asked Mag to kill the boss as soon as he finds him because it is an absolute rule of this world. While telling all of this, Loa herself was hiding behind Magu. He laughed and asked Loa why she is afraid despite being a dragon. Loa told him that she is not afraid, but she is not good with these kinds of dark places. Mag tried to calm her down. He said that even if something happens, everyone here is more than powerful enough. He also reminded her of his promise that he will use the power to protect everyone else. Mira asked him if the sword and dagger contain both of their powers, to which Mag agreed. During their conversation, Magu realized that a lot of monsters have gathered behind Mira and they were about to attack her. But Mira created water jets from her water bracelet and killed all the monsters. Magu was amazed and praised Mira. Mira told him that it was the result of everyday training, and she believed that there will be many times when monsters will suddenly attack them just like now. She asked Magu to accept the water bracelet as her power gift. She explained that this bracelet is part of her power, and if he uses it carefully, 
he will be able to prevent surprise attacks. Magu was really thankful because he was always been taken care of. Mira said that it is nothing, and she is still a guest in his house. Then they decided to go even further inside. They were attacked by groups of monsters the entire way, but the three divine beasts were unnaturally strong, so they were able to continue without much issue. Magu realized that whenever they went the wrong way, a group of monsters attacked them. It was like they were being guided by the monsters. Loa told him that they are about to reach the halfway point. Loa explained that the halfway point is a large room in the middle of the dungeon, and a powerful monster known as the Keeper will be guarding it. Mira wondered that it may be the main monster here, and it wants to get them to the inside portions as quickly as possible by testing their strength. Magu said that if it is true that they are being guided, then it will be a good thing, and on the brighter side, this will be quicker and easier for them. Fia teased him by saying that Magu is getting used to all of this. They reached the halfway point, and there was a big door closed with the help of a chain. It was like a big room ahead of them. Magu warned them not to act too rash from here on. The dungeon is massive, and they may struggle here. Mag said that he wants to support and protect all of them, to which all three divine beasts replied that he is capable of anything. Fia then broke the door with the help of fireballs. They all decided to move inside. Magu was nervous. He tried to calm himself down. He was sure that in the company of three divine beasts, he will be fine. To Mag's surprise, there was a monster standing inside that room. It was none other than the lizard man who killed Mag's parents back then. Mag was shocked. He started recalling all the moments from the day his parents died. He was angry that why the lizard man is still alive. Mag was sad and angry. Why is the lizard man still alive? Thought Mag. All three divine beasts noticed that Mag's emotions were out of control and something was wrong with him. Mag told them that the lizard man was one of the monsters that attacked his hometown a long time ago. His mother and father managed to defeat it, but as a result, they died. Someone had turned the lizard man into an undead. Realizing that it didn't matter right now, he had to fight. The lizard man tried to attack him, but he couldn't prevent the attack. He was afraid, and his body couldn't move. Kelpi rescued Mag, and both the dragon and phoenix started fighting with the lizard man. Mag was sad that he couldn't do anything, and that he was just a burden to them. Both the dragon and phoenix were attacking, but the lizard man deflected their attacks with his shield. Mag wondered how they were supposed to deal with him, feeling scared and wanting to run away. Meanwhile, Loa came and hugged Mag, knowing that he was scared. Phoenix and Kalpi were busy protecting their master. Loa asked Mag not to give up, telling him that they were all drawn to him through his strong desire to live. Phoenix and Kalpi were getting weaker due to the lizard man's attacks. Loa started crying and asked Mag to protect them because they all wanted to live a long life with him. That's it, Mag thought. I'm different from those days when I couldn't do anything. Now I have the strength to fight, and I have reliable friends. Mag realized that their lives were all connected, and it wouldn't be good if his life ended in a place like this. He said that he wanted to live with all three of them, refusing to let anyone die in front of him. He was now motivated to kill the lizard man. They all attacked together, but the lizard man's shield was weird. It distorted all kinds of magic. Mag thought of a trick. He knew that through decoy, he could lure all kinds of beasts. Monsters could hear him from wherever he was, and he could see the exact location of a monster even in a smoke screen. It was time to put his skill into practical use. The trick worked out according to his expectations, and he succeeded in defeating the lizard man. They were all happy, but Fia and Loa scolded Mag for acting rashly, though they were glad the lizard man didn't hurt him. Mag apologized, and Mira praised him for his bravery. She also wondered if she would be able to control this type of attack using her bracelet. Mag wondered how strong the boss could be if the monsters were this strong at the midpoint. They were all busy talking when suddenly a crack appeared on the roof of the room. A big hand came out of the crack and grabbed Mag. Then they heard a voice, found you. The hand went back inside the crack with Mag, and the crack disappeared. Everything happened so fast that Loa, Fia, and Mira didn't have time to protect Mag. They were left speechless. It was the hand of the demon god that brought Mag into his world. For thousands of years, I slept within this land. A little more, a little further, and my full power will be restored. I must be prepared so I don't make the same mistake again. The world will be in my hands once again, he said. For that reason alone, first I will. Then he stopped. He looked at his hand with the expectation that he caught a divine beast, but to his surprise, there was a boy. Mag was shocked and surprised. He couldn't understand what was happening to him. God asked, what is a child doing among gods and beasts? Who is he? Mag wondered what this thing was since it was obviously alive. He asked the demon god who he was and why he was aiming for Mira. The demon god said, For humans who don't even know my name, well, I'll tell you as a souvenir. My name is Desperado. 
Mag was shocked to learn that the demon god was alive, the one who had traded off with the first caller. God explained that he is one of the seven demon lords, controlling this dungeon as one of its pillars. What? Did he call himself one of the seven demon lords? No way, it means there are seven demons in total, Magu thought. The demon god told Mag that he had been waiting for divine beasts, but it had become excessively boring. He had planned to invite the divine beasts here one by one as a reward for defeating the keeper. He thought that he would devour them all. But if there is such a child, it's a good thing that he was awakened. As a reward for coming this far, he will at least add Mag to the ranks of the goals wandering this dungeon. Mag pulled out his sword and attacked the demon god, saying that he won't let him do what he wants. The demon god prevented the attack with his sickle and wondered how a child like him could manage to wield the power of divine beasts. Then he looked into Magu's eyes and said, You remind me of that one. How unpleasant. You deserve death. Mac was worried but a little relieved that he had been practicing how to use the powers of divine beasts so he could somehow fight him. However, the burden on Mag's body was immense. The demon beast wondered how Mag was using the power of both the phoenix and the dragon together. He asked Mag if he was the divine beast tamer of this era. Mag wondered what divine beast tamer meant. The demon beast was angry that he had used the dagger and sword in front of him and that he should know what it means to wield those. It was foolish of him to jump in. Mag tried to attack the demon god with his sword, but the demon god prevented the attack using his sickle. After that, the demon god tried to attack him, but Mag created a water shield in front of him with the help of the water bracelet. It was also shocking for the demon god that Mag was using a kelpie's power. Mag then attacked the demon with a water jet, which injured him. The demon angrily shouted that he was not going to forgive Maku. The demon god said, How dare you inflict an injury upon this desperado? I was ready to kill you for free. He attacked Magu with his big hand, but Magu stopped the attack with the help of the dagger bracelet and sword. The demon god told Magu that the air covering his body was made of super dense magical power. It can prevent any and all kinds of physical attacks. Furthermore, it can be converted into a barrier that prevents all magic. With the power of this offense and defense, he became one of the seven demon lords and reigned in one of the strongest corners of the world. However, one person dared to stand in front of him and challenged him to a battle. He was a human, yet he brought so many beasts. He combined the power of his beasts and managed to pierce the demon god's shield. One divine beast wasn't a threat, but the power of multiple united became a threat. The combined power destroyed some of the demon god's brethren. The demon god got injured so badly that he had to sleep for thousands of years to survive. But he refused to make the same mistake again. He was not ready to let a human crush him again. He again attacked Mag with his big hand. Magu managed to remain unharmed, but he was worried because he was running out of stamina. In addition to the continuous battle, the demon god's attacks were too intense. The demon god sensed that Mag was getting weak. Mag was reaching his limits, but then he thought that he needed to endure this and fight back. He would only be able to protect his loved ones through fighting back. Mag sensed that there was something wrong. The distance between him and the demon god was getting shorter. It was because the demon god was getting bigger and bigger. He told Mag that now he was too late to avoid what was coming. The demon man attacked Mag with a lot of air daggers. Mag thought that if he got hit by even one of these, he would not survive. There was no time for hesitation, it was all or nothing. The demon man found Mag's despair amusing. He wanted to enjoy this exciting moment. Mag created a water shield, but even that shield couldn't withstand this number of attacks and started breaking. The demon noticed Mag's eyes. Those eyes, those strong eyes overflowing with life, he said. That life is sparkling in your eyes as if you are here to kill me. I was almost destroyed once by the man I despised, with those very same eyes. Let me say this one last time. Divine Beast Tamer, you are not weak. You endured my attacks and even managed to make me fear. You may have been my greatest enemy, and yet your body is not fully accustomed to the power of the three divine beasts. It has become clear that you have reached your limits, and now you no longer have a chance of winning. Mag said, you are right. I feel like I am reaching the limit of how long I can use these powers, but I will destroy you before that can happen. The demon shouted, nonsense, you inferior species, and attacked Mag with his sickle. To his surprise, Mag stopped the attack using the dagger, bracelet, and sword. The demon wondered why Mag was not falling down. It was clear that his body had already exceeded its limits, yet he remained standing. Mag said, it's simple. It is because I can't die here. I thought I would die for the good of the city when I received the decoy, but I met everyone who helped me a lot. I have realized there is still far more that I can do. Now that I am not alone, now that there is someone waiting for me to return, I can't lose to you knowing that you are aiming for those important to me. Mag said that this is the power of the divine beasts ruling over this world. 
He doesn't care if he uses this body for this purpose. Then he asked all three beasts' weapons to lend him their powers. Meanwhile, the demon god also attacked with his sickle. Mag's swords recoiled from the power, but Mag picked them up again and attacked the demon god. The demon tried to stop the attack but failed. He wondered why all of these impossible things were happening. The demon said, I know this sense of unease. This desperado was awakened. I always thought it had something to do with the divine beast's power, but it was different. I was drawn towards you. To which Mag replied, No way, a reaction to my skill. The demon told him that it was not his skill, but his ferocious spirit that was fighting to overcome adversity, even surviving against the demon god. He was drawn to that. Demon said, This strength, whether good or evil, is where the bravest of souls lie. A person capable of defeating a demon lord is no longer in the same category as a human. That power you hold will surely lure you into further battles. Prepare yourself for your fearful and troubled destiny. Mag told him that he would fight for his life and protect his loved ones. While saying that, Mag pierced the demon's body with his dagger. The demon died, and with that, it was all over. Mag woke up and found himself in his room. He saw Loa entering the room, holding a bowl of water. When she noticed that Mag was now awake, she ran towards him. She handed the bowl to Mag and hugged him tightly. She started crying and told him that she was really scared about what would happen to him. Thea also entered the room and shouted, Master. Mag told them that they were being a little noisy. Fia told him that he was covered in blood when they found him, so they didn't know what would happen. Mira stayed with him for three days and nights, trying to heal him. Mag got shocked upon hearing that he had been sleeping for three days. Mira told him that she was glad that he finally woke up. Mag apologized for making them worried. Well, they were all glad that Mag was now alright. Loa then asked him curiously what happened in the dungeon because when they reached there, they saw something disappearing next to Mag. Mag told them who was there. Demon Lord Desperado, they all shouted. Loa said that the dungeon master really was a demon lord. Moreover, they would never have known that there were seven demon lords. Fia then praised Mac, how he turned the tables and managed to defeat the demon lord, to which Mac replied that it was only at the very last moment. Fia wrapped her hand around his shoulder and teased him, saying that it's just as she expected from him. Loa shouted that why Fia was hurting their master. Mira came and tried to heal Mag again by putting her hand on his chest. Mag's face turned red due to shyness because she was very close to him. Loa got jealous and told Mag that she would leave him because of Fee and Mira. Mag calmed her down. Mira told him that the meal was ready and she would bring it to his room. Mag refused by saying that he would come to the dining room himself. Mira started setting the dining table. When Mag came out of his room, he got surprised. It was because treasure was lying in one corner of the room. There were a lot of gold coins, rubies, and diamonds. Fia told him that the treasure was hidden deep within the dungeon, and it was natural that they had to get it. Fia then handed a ring to Mag and asked him to try it on. Mag put on the ring on his index finger. Soon Mira entered the room with a worried face. She told Mag and Fia that she came in because she suddenly couldn't sense Mag. Mag then realized that the ring erased the presence of its owner and it could even block some skills and magic. He got happy. He told them that maybe he could even go down to the human village. Thea agreed with him and said that with this much gold, silver, and treasure, it would be a waste if he didn't use it, so he should go down to the human village and do some shopping. Mag also thought that the self-sufficient lifestyle had been pretty fulfilling, but they had come to the point where they were lacking in various ways. But Loa then added that there was a problem, that the ring's power only lasted for around five days. This news made Mag sad again. Loa then explained that the caller's power is immense, so that's the limit of the ring. But Loa ensured that they could do shopping for him once they were in the human village. Mag said, To be honest, it's a bit disheartening to only have five days. I thought I would have to spend my whole life in the mountains. I should honestly be happy for this opportunity. He was ready to visit the human village. All of them got excited because they were going to enjoy both traveling and shopping. Mag sat down on the back of the dragon, while Phoenix offered a ride to Mira because she couldn't fly. They started flying towards the village. Loa was also protecting Mag from the wind. Mag tried to play with clouds using his sword. Loa told him that raising his sword like that made him look like a legendary dragon rider. She explained that most of the dragon riders were also callers. While flying, they all noticed a giant animal footprint in the forest. It was surprising for all of them. Loa said that it looked like something huge had passed through there. Mira wondered that perhaps it was one of the four great divine beasts. She explained that it's a story about a gigantic monster far outside the standard, known as a walking disaster, but as they were not going in that direction, the chances of seeing it were very low. Suddenly, the kitten poked her face out of Mag's jacket. Mag said that he was worried about leaving the kitten behind, so he brought her with him. 
They also asked the cat not to do anything dangerous. Lower realized that the kitten was just a monster thrown out of the dungeon. According to her, when a dungeon is subjugated and disappears, the other monsters also disappear. But it was Maya's relationship with them that kept her from disappearing. Soon, they realized that they had arrived somewhere. But to their surprise, it was not the village, but the royal capital. Mira said that both Fia and Loa would create a big fuss in the city if they went down there like this, so they should get off a little further away. Loa remembered flying here a long time ago. They found the city very amazing and large. Mag said that he knew they were surprised, but they should really get going. Loa asked all of them to stick together because the city was too big. Their first destination was a jewelry shop where they exchanged some gold coins and rubies for money. After that, they started their shopping. Fia and Mira tried ice cream and lots of other delicious foods. But Loa just purchased some books from the library. It was a little surprising for Mag. Loa explained that the book was interesting, but it was a bit difficult to read and she wanted to read something a little easier. Moreover, she was going to live with Mag, so she wanted to learn some human alphabets as well. Mira suggested that they should find an inn to stay before it gets dark. They started searching for the inn, but there was a girl noticing all of them from behind. After completing all of their shopping, they decided to enjoy a good meal at an inn. The innkeeper informed them about a female public bath, so they made the decision to go there to alleviate their exhaustion. Loa invited Mag to join them, which caught the attention of everyone present. Feeling embarrassed, Mag excused himself and went outside to sit near the fountain, enjoying his drink. He noticed that there was no one around, but he could hear the sound of footsteps. Curious, he called out, is someone there? Suddenly, a beautiful girl appeared before him and reassured him that she meant no harm, apologizing for startling him. Mag soon realized that she too was a beast, but she took offense and requested that he not compare her to those wild creatures. Introducing herself as Kusano, a nine-tailed fox who travels through eternity, she explained that the nine-tailed foxes were divine beasts that, according to an ancient legend, have existed for thousands of years. Mag remarked, Are you a divine beast as well? You seem to be doing a remarkable job of concealing it. You possess the caller skill, don't you? The girl acknowledged that Mag's ability to deduce her true nature indicated that he was a strong individual who had encountered and survived encounters with divine beasts before. She expressed the need to speak with Mag, which prompted her to seek him out. Kusanoha then invited Mag to be her tea-drinking companion, a request to which he readily agreed. They proceeded to her spacious and splendid house. As Kusanoha prepared the tea, she invited Mag to take a seat. Mag remarked that her home resembled that of a human. She explained that she had chosen to live as a normal human being in this city. When Mag inquired why she resided in the royal capital, Kusanoha elaborated, revealing that she had arrived there several decades ago and found it convenient for various reasons. Being closer to immortality than a phoenix, she believed that a few decades long vacation wouldn't be such a bad idea. However, due to the city's predominantly human population, she had found it difficult to form close friendships where she could truly open up. As she served the tea and filled Mag's cup, he asked why the tea was green. Kusanoha explained that it was an oriental tea, carrying the unforgettable taste of her hometown, and she frequently ordered it. Urging Mag to finish the tea before it cooled, she awaited their conversation. Mag began to enjoy his tea while Kusanoha expressed her desire to discuss more than just herself, as it would become boring. She also wanted to learn more about Mag and asked if he would be willing to share about himself. Mag proceeded to tell her his story, including how his life had undergone a complete transformation after receiving the decoy skill. Kusanoha empathized with him, understanding the impact such an event could have. Mag mentioned that the reason he was still alive was due to the support and strength he received from everyone around him. However, Kusanoha noticed a strength in his eyes. Suddenly, Fia, Loa, and Mira arrived to protect their master. Kusanoha offered tea to all of them, and while Fia and Mira enjoyed their tea, Loa began scolding Mag. She expressed her worry, thinking that Mag had been kidnapped, and mentioned that it had been difficult to find him because of the rain. Loa also stated that it was not wise to blindly follow any divine beast. Mag sincerely apologized, and Mira requested Loa to drop the topic since Mag was safe and they had found him. Mira also mentioned that Kusanoha didn't seem bad and that her tea and sweets were delicious. Kusanoha expressed her relief that the misunderstanding had been cleared up but didn't expect them to be accompanied by three other divine beasts. She remarked that the fact that a human could coexist with them meant that the true caller of this era had appeared, just like the one who would subjugate a demon lord. Mag asked Kusanoha if the first caller had also lived with divine beasts, to which she replied that she had heard such stories from her master, who had met the first caller. Loa inquired if Kusanoha's master was the famous silver celestial dragon, but she denied it. 
Fia asked if Kuzunoha still held the position of head of the Oriental Divine Beasts, and if it was appropriate for a disciple like her to be drinking tea in a foreign land. Kuzunoha explained that it was her long overdue vacation as her strict master had driven her to run away. She then led them all to a magic shop, which had an unpleasant odor. Kuzunoha searched for the shopkeeper, and Fia overheard an argument inside. Eventually, the peculiar shopkeeper with a covered face appeared. Kuzunoha informed the shopkeeper that she wanted to purchase a grimoire. Mag wondered why he would need a grimoire since they were designed for practicing sorcery. Kuzunoha explained that despite his poor aptitude for magic, he was able to harness a portion of the immense magical power of divine beasts and had a natural sense for handling magic, unconsciously transmitting the voice of his heart to reach the hearts of divine beasts and others. This ability was facilitated by consuming the magic power within the atmosphere. With the help of an authentic grimoire, he would be able to use magic properly. The shopkeeper brought forth a grimoire, mentioning that it was the last one in the store. Surprisingly, it was a short book, contrary to their expectations of it being thick and large. As Mag held the book, it began to emit a blue light, indicating his affinity with it. Kuzunoha attempted to awaken the grimoire with the help of magic. 